Well, Varun, thank you so much for being with us. Can you just state sort of the context in which you um, lead and train chaplains? Thank you for having me. So grateful to be with you. Uh, my name is Varun Soni. I'm the Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life at the University of Southern California. And in that role, I oversee um, more than 50 chaplains representing all faith traditions um, and uh, humanist chaplains for atheist agnostic students as well. Um, and over 90 student religious groups. And I get to do this in Los Angeles, which is the most religiously diverse city in the world. So there's never a dull moment. Love it. Right now we are welcoming post-millennials, Generation Z for the first time to college campuses. This is the least religiously affiliated generation in American history. Whereas 2% of their grandparents entered college uh, not affiliated with religion, 50% of my students are entering college not affiliated with religion. And so if chaplains don't have a sense of working with students who are not a religiously affiliated, who weren't raised with organized or institutional religion, and who might actively distrust organized and institutionalized religion, they're gonna have a very limited ability to engage and support an entire university community. And so for me, when I'm thinking about um, who to hire, I'm thinking about people who understand this future, a future of non-affiliation and the promise and pitfalls uh, that emerge because of this unique demographic um, shift. Varun, when you think about working with the unaffiliated, that is, that is not only for higher education context, but across context, but for higher education purposes, um, working with the religiously unaffiliated, what are some things you can imagine that um, educators of trainers, whether that's in seminary contexts or CPE, what can what are some um, what are some ways to make sure that chaplains are trained in that way to understand working with the unaffiliated? So I have a particular point of view here, and my point of view is very much influenced by my colleague Lisa Miller's work, uh, especially her book, The Spiritual Child. Uh, Lisa Miller is a researcher at a Columbia University, and in that book, she cites studies that show that if you have an intergenerational religious or spiritual experience growing up, that means if you go to church or Gudvara or synagogue or temple or masjid with your parents or great grandparents or have some other experience growing up that's ritualized and connects you with a reality that's larger than yourself, then you are 80% less likely to experience depression as a young adult. So now in the age of the unaffiliated, what I'm seeing is a full-blown mental, emotional, and spiritual health crisis amongst young people. Uh, And it gets worse every year. 65% of our students across the country say that they're so overwhelmed by anxiety that they have trouble functioning. That means that anxiety is baseline now. One third are wrestling with depression and 10% of our students across the country have contemplated suicide over the last year. Uh, On a campus of 50,000 students, you can imagine how many students that impacts just in my community, let alone across the landscape of American higher education. And so my point of view is that because students have been unaffiliated with religion and they've been deprived of the protective factors that religion has historically provided its practitioners, then we have to uh, understand how we take religion out of a religious context and presented in more secularized ways. This might be controversial for the purists, but I don't have the luxury of being a purist. Maybe as a as the professor of religion in my classroom, I can wax eloquently about the challenges of taking meditation or yoga out of Buddhist and Hindu contexts. And as someone who identifies with both traditions, I understand the very real danger of doing that. But as someone who's responsible for the well-being of 50,000 students, I am desperate. I am desperate to do whatever I can to support my students. And if they tell me yoga is helping, meditation is helping, they tell me the coloring book sessions are helping, if they tell me comfort dogs are helping, if they tell me a walking meditation is helping, whatever they're telling me, I'm, I'm listening to. And I will do anything I can to try and translate the timeless wisdom of our traditions into timely action for today's students. So I think that chaplains who want to work with young people really have to creatively reinterpret their traditions, not be purists about what, you know, how they might have inherited their traditions, and to literally pick and choose the things that are life affirming and life saving to prevent to present to students who have not grown up with those protective factors. Given the rise in mental health crises and the need for um, higher education chaplains to be um, really attuned to how to grapple with the crises as they come and to be part of helping prevent them, um, from from getting worse. Um, and given that in much of pastoral care, or just traditionally, if we're thinking about Christian 
um, theological education, um, often a mainstay of pastoral care is refer, refer, refer. So given that legacy and where we've been, and then given research that's come out recently about how great it is for mental health care professionals to partner with higher education chaplains, what would you say um, people preparing to be higher education chaplains and those training higher education chaplains need to know about that intersection? So what I found is you don't need to be an expert in um, psychiatry or even um, in mental health issues, um, but you need to be proficient in working across traditional boundaries. And so, for example, what we've done at USC is every time we have a chaplain meeting every month, we have a liaison from the counseling center who sits in on our chaplain's meeting. This has been going on for 10 years. At first, it was hard to do because there's been, in the United States anyway, a real divide for the last 100 years between religion and psychology. But um, we found like-minded people in our counseling center um, who uh, wanted to do this work. And what we found is by, the, by having these relationships between chaplains and our mental health professionals on campus, um, these friendships, if you will, uh, referrals happened much easier. Varun Sony, thank you so much for being with us and for helping us get a better picture of how best to train higher education um, chaplains and spiritual care providers. Thank you. So grateful to you for all the work that you're doing.